Good morning and welcome to worship at First Presbyterian Church. It is great to have you here as we continue through our new series for the new year, The Church That Jesus Built. Now, one of the things that I've been looking at a lot are the creeds. Uh, We opened last week with the Apostles' Creed, but there are a lot of really great creeds out there, and I want us to continue kind of in this vein. So this morning, our call to worship is going to be the Nicene Creed. I realize that's not as familiar maybe to some of you. Uh, You have memorized the Apostles' Creed, but we're going to use that this morning. It will be on the screen if you would please join me in our call to worship. There we are. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became truly human. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is worshiped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. With that, that is how we begin our worship here, by declaring what it is we believe. And now I'll ask you to stand and greet those around you in the fellowship of the Holy Spirit.
be seated. The church has a long history of faithful worship and service, and yet it's easy to settle into comfort and convenience and routines that lose the urgency of the gospel. We become complacent. Our focus narrows to our own desires rather than discerning what God wants us to be. Let us be cleansed of our sin. Let us pray first in unison and then in silence. Oh, holy God, we come back to you once again to renew our commitment. We confess that pride has led us to build a church and a faith that bends to the false gods of the world, wealth, comfort, convenience, security, and the like. We pay more attention to our beliefs than to your truth. Your word is not planted firmly on our hearts, and we have neglected our spiritual gifting. O oh God, bring us back to you and renew our hearts so we might be your faithful servants. The Lord forgives the iniquity of his people and covers all their sins. He sets aside his wrath and turns from his fierce anger. Friends in Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Amen.
Somebody sent me a, uh, a story this week, and it, it was from, uh, it was actually a, a sermon with a story in it from another pastor uh, here in town, just they wanted me to see it. And the story uh, that the pastor told came from a book called like Spiritual Stories or something like that. It was, it was great. And I, after listening to it, felt so compelled to bring that story to you all this morning. So I'm going to start with that. It goes like this. On a dangerous seacoast where shipwrecks often occur, there was once a crude little life-saving station. The building was no more than a hut, and there was only one boat, but the few devoted members kept a constant watch over the sea. With no thought for themselves, they went out day and night, tirelessly searching for the lost. Some of those who were saved and various others in the surrounding area wanted to be associated with the station and give their time, money, and effort to support the work. New boats were bought and new crews trained and the little life-staving station grew. Some of these new members of the life-saving station were unhappy that the building was so crude and poorly equipped. They felt that a more comfortable place should be provided as the first refuge of those who were saved from the sea. They replaced the emergency cots with beds and put better furniture in the enlarged building. Now the life-saving station became a popular gathering place for its members. They decorated it beautifully and furnished it exquisitely and used it as a sort of club. Fewer members were not interested in going to sea on life-saving missions, so they hired lifeboat crews to do this work. The life-saving motif still prevailed in this club's decoration, and there was a memorial lifeboat in the room where the club initiations were held. About this time, a large ship was wrecked off the coast, and the hired crews brought in boatloads of cold, wet, half-drowned people. They were dirty and sick. Some of them were foreigners. The beautiful new club was in chaos. Immediately, the property committee hired someone to rig up a shower house outside the club where victims of shipwrecks could be cleaned up before they came inside. And at the next meeting, there was a split in the club membership. Most of the members wanted to stop the club's life-saving activities because they felt they were unpleasant and a hindrance to the normal social life. A small number of members insisted upon life-saving as their primary purpose and pointed out that they were still called a life-saving station. The small group's members were voted down and told that if they wanted to save lives, they could begin their own life-saving station down the coast. So they did. As the years went by, however, the new station experienced the same changes that had occurred in the old station. It evolved into a club, and yet another life-saving station was founded. And history continued to repeat itself and if you visit that seacoast today, you will find a number of exclusive clubs along that shore. Shipwrecks are still frequent in those waters, but now most of the passengers drown. The church that Jesus built believes in truth. And the truth is that if we want to call ourselves a church, our primary mission is to be a life-saving station for the community of Bradenton and beyond. And our series, The Church That Jesus Built, is going to challenge us to really deeply examine all year the biblical principles upon which the church was built. And it's going to keep those principles in the forefront of our minds. So they guide us throughout this year to see if together we can become something new and fresh and different, something clearly obviously and blatantly Christian by Christ's own standards. So that's the series, that's the goal, 
Last week, we kicked things off by looking at the original church. It was instituted by Jesus Himself directly to His apostle Peter, who ran in after Jesus was gone and watched how it spread. And we realized as we looked at like 40 churches last week and their different areas as they spread from Jerusalem through Judea out into the world, basically every church had a couple of principles in common. One, their gathering was intentional with holy purpose. And two, their goal was spiritual formation that led to conversion and or transformation. So today we're going to look at the need for truth as a foundational basis for church life. And we're going to see how Jesus addresses the truth issues of His day. Now, if you have a Bible or you have a Bible app or the church app and you want to punch up the e-Bible, we're going to be in John chapter 8. We're going to be in verses 31 through 36. And this is uh, Jesus in in a unique context that I'll talk about in just a moment using the word truth in a very specific way. Let us listen now and hear God's Word for us. To the Jews who had believed Him, Jesus said, if you hold to my teaching, you are really my disciples. Then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. They answered him, we are Abraham's descendants and have never been slaves of anyone. How can you say that we shall be set free? And Jesus replied, very truly I tell you, everyone who sins is a slave to sin. Now a slave has no permanent place in the family, but a son belongs to it forever. So if the son sets you free, you will be free indeed. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Now, Jesus has entered the theological equivalent of a war zone at this point in John's gospel. And there's an increase in hostility towards him and towards his message. Even in verse 31, we see evidence of that hostility because Jesus is preaching to all of the Jews, all the people around, anybody who will listen, Jesus will preach to. But they're divided between the Jews who believed him and the Jews who did not believe him. And the point that Jesus is making is that only one of those groups actually has the right answer. They can't both be right. One of these groups has the truth and one believes a lie. I know that sounds really harsh, but they can't both be right. Now, they both want to be right. And some people looking in might actually hope that they both are right. Because that way everyone wins, no one gets offended, there are no losers, everyone gets what they want exactly the way they want it. Sounds good, right? Win, win, win all the way around. Unfortunately, in this case, it's not biblical, it's not what Jesus taught or said. And even more unfortunately, it's that these kinds of mentalities we've allowed to be in our culture and to creep in to our churches, and that is a very big problem. Now the conversation shifts to the ancestry of the Jews. They thought they had the the market cornered because of, of their Jewish ancestry, and Jesus draws another line. He says, being a child of God has nothing to do with being born into a certain family. It doesn't matter who your great, 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 great grandpa was. That's not how you become a child of God. Becoming a child of God, Jesus goes on to say, is about believing that the fullness of God came through His Son, Jesus Christ. And when we make a commitment to serve Him and be in relationship with Him, that's when we become a child of God. And this revelation is given to the whole world, first 
to the Jewish people, and then it spreads to everyone else. And that produces spiritual freedom that was not previously able to be attained. Again, this is problematic because everyone here wants to be right. Some people looking in might hope that both groups are right, and that way everyone wins, no one gets offended, there's peace, no losers, everyone gets what they want the way they want it. But it's not biblical, it's not what Jesus taught or said, and unfortunately we've let it permeate into our culture and into our church culture, and that is a major problem. Now, here's the real problem. I'm going to point the finger at myself for just a second. Churches and church leaders and pastors, they don't really like to hammer on biblical truth because it's divisive. We live in a world that tells us all, you can believe what you want, just don't impose your values on me. And again, the real problem, the real, real problem is that we've allowed that into our churches. So churches today, rather than looking like something that Jesus built, look like a mishmash of theological preferences, of creature comforts, of of the gospel message light and happy We've given ourselves over to entertainment and accommodation and tolerance and to each their own as long as it's kind of within our general scope. We live in a world that doesn't believe in truth, and what the church has done is we've allowed ourselves to be assimilated into that culture, not the other way around. And we hardly even realize it most of the time. A former police chief in California is noted as once having said that the church is supposed to be above the world. And the issue is that as the world nosedives with its morality, the church tends to follow suit. We usually stay above the world just to a certain extent. We accommodate our values so we stay just above the world rather than claiming and leaning on a higher standard of truth. What truth does is provide us with boundaries to let us know if we're playing the game right. Anybody watched a football game recently at all? Okay. I stayed up way too late watching a football game last night, um, and my team lost and it was disappointing, but I knew I was watching football. Uh, There's rules in American football, NFL football, college football, what have you. Like, you have to stay inside the big white rectangle, okay? It's just, I'm just boiling it down to the basics here for sports fans and non-sports fans alike. Stay in the big white rectangle, that's the playing field. If you're outside of that, you're out of bounds. And if you want to score points, you have to get the ball across the big fat white line that's called the goal line. And if you don't, even if you're like an eighth of an inch, a blade of grass short of touching that white line, it's not worth any points. But when you cross over that, it's worth six points and eventually seven. Now, if you try to throw the ball forward two times during a single play, that's against the rules. They'll stop what you're doing right there. It's a penalty. If you grab someone, if you hold someone, if you trip someone, it's against the rules. And those boundaries are provided so that you know when you turn on the TV if you are watching NFL or college American football or Australian rules football or football, like soccer, or rugby, which are all kind of sort of similar sports. But it's the boundaries that dictate to us 
what we're watching, what they're playing. When I was a kid, we had a neighbor on the street. We had a bunch of little kids on the street, and one big neighbor is like, 12 or 13, and the rest of us were like five, six, seven years old. We used to play football all the time. And this guy, Steve, um, he, would, he would always say, let's play one on everybody, and he was the one, okay? <laughs> and what he would do is he would, he would, on the first play of the game, hike the ball to himself, and, and then he'd throw it over the first kid's head and catch it, and then throw it over the next kid's head and keep throwing the ball in the air until he scored a touchdown. And he'd spike the ball and say, seven points, there you go. And we'd all go, okay, cool, he scored. Um, Then on the next play, he would throw the ball off to us like a kickoff. We would run and Steve would grab whoever was running with the ball, pick them up, carry them all the way back to their own end zone, drop them there and say, safety, two points. And every time you played with Steve, two plays into the game, you're down nine nothing. And then like soon it was 18 nothing. And it was just, and you're sitting here, if I put that on TV and told you that was football, you'd go, no, it is not. That's not the rules of football. That's just a game where Steven wants to dominate little kids. That's, that's what that sport's called. And they don't show it on ESPN. It's down on like ESPN 7 or something like that, okay? They don't show that sport. Truth provides boundaries. It's like a recipe. Um, My girls decided to make pancakes. It was just last weekend. They wanted to make pancakes. And um, gave them a box. I'm, I'm lazy, so I just get the one where you just add water, and they still taste great, Okay. Um, so I give the kids the box and they're debating if they want to make 12 or 24 pancakes. They've got everything out. They pour it. They call me in a few minutes. Dad, hey, get over here. I'm like, okay, what's going on? I say, well, our pancakes don't look right. And they're in the bowl. And I grab the, the whisk and I start stirring around and it's like just watery goo. And I'm like, well, um, it looks like you guys didn't follow the directions. What are you trying to do? And one of them's like, we're trying to make 24 pancakes. And the other one's like, no, 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 we tried to make 12. So I imagine this is what happened is they put enough water in for 24 pancakes, enough mix in for 12. So we went back to the directions. We doubled the mix, started stirring it up. Voila, gorgeous pancakes. And it's within those boundaries, that recipe, that we're able to make pancakes and not like watery white sludge in a bowl. Within the boundaries, we get it right. So why don't we apply those same principles to our faith and to our spiritual lives and to our church? Why do we allow lines to be blurred so easily? Why do we allow cultural precepts that have zero biblical foundation at all become our rallying cries and our truth statements? See, the culture around us no longer respects the Bible as any sort of authority or sort of truth, but we act the same way a lot of the time. Let me give you a clear-cut example, and this is just one basic, straightforward example I'm going to talk about church attendance, okay? This is just basic biblical standards. The Bible teaches that the first church, when it got together, met every single day. It's in Acts chapter 2, every single day at their homes. Can you imagine that? Who wants to open up their home here? I'm looking for a volunteer to this church coming over to your house every day so that we can have church. Like, I don't. Um, you don't. Anybody? Bob, you're, are you not? Uh, the Shermer's address, and no, I'm just kidding. So, here's, right, like, they got together every day. That was part of their routine. It was like they centered their lives on gathering all the time. They set this really lofty standard, and since then, church attendance has become optional even for strong Christians. And the Sabbath, non-existent in our culture today. 
even in church culture. A survey was done a few years back. They asked Christians, it was like a big group like Barna or something did the study, and they asked a lot of solid Christians to uh, say why they miss church most often. Why do you miss church? It's an interesting list. Number 10 was, I'm not actually a Christian. So that makes sense. You give a, you give a um, survey to a bunch of strong Christians and people say, well, I'm not actually, I'm just kind of faking it. Um, so that makes sense. If they're not a Christian, they're not coming to church. Number nine, I am sick and that's okay too. You know, don't come to church sick. We learned that, you know, a couple years ago, we, we dealt with all this. Stay home, get well. Number eight, I have a life change going on. Number seven, I work too much. Number six, I'm new and I feel like an outsider. Number five, I am too busy. Number four, I feel hurt by the church. And then it got really interesting. I feel like this is where the real honest folks really got in. Number three answer was, I am lazy. And number two said, I am worldly. And number one was actually just, I have a lot of excuses and I can justify every single one in my mind. And I do. So if we learn that getting into the Scriptures, we should be meeting regularly as a church, outside of number 10 and number 9, I don't think there's anything to justify not coming to church regularly. And in our rhythm these days, we come to church on Sundays, and we come to church on the weekends. Um, So it's just excuses. It's just all excuses, and not even good excuses. The thing is, we don't let the Bible become our source of authority and truth And we don't filter our thinking processes through scriptures. If we did, we would see that if there was no reason they couldn't get together 2,000 years ago on a daily basis, that's how they reorganize their whole lives in the first church. We should be able to reorganize our lives the same way. That's what the Bible says. If we read it, and we read about the expectations, we would know that not being at church, except rarely, is a big no-no. If we let the Bible be our source of authority and truth, we'd have to let go of our excuses and our justifications. We'd actually have to change our patterns, no matter how much we try to justify ourselves in our own minds. And that's just one example. And you're here, so good job. Like, I mean, I'm not really harping on you. You're here. But there's plenty of examples. I'm not trying to guilt anyone into, into being here more, quite frankly, as far as I'm concerned with Christians. I don't care what church they go to as long as they're going to a church and engaging in spiritual transformation and engaging with Christ. It doesn't bother me one way or the other. I'm really glad we're here together. But the truth we acknowledge as Christians is God's Word in our lives. That's our authority. That's our… That's our directions. That's our boundaries. And God tells us what to do and what to be, and it's all written out for us so we don't have to second guess. Any second guessing is placing it through the lens of our own lives, our own cultural experiences. Now, I'm going to close today. I want to revisit the story that I told at the beginning. I didn't finish it. Um, We're going to pick up like at the last paragraph right before I left off so you all can get kind of acclimated. It says, as the years went by, however, the new station experienced the same changes that had occurred in the old station. It evolved into a club and yet another life-saving station was founded. History continued to repeat itself. And if you visit that seacoast today, you will find a number of exclusive clubs along that shore. Shipwrecks are still frequent in those waters, but now most of the passengers drown. As disciples of Jesus, our primary task is to go and make disciples. To put it another way, we are to go and save lives. Unfortunately, we sometimes forget 
our purpose. And we need to recover our passion for life-saving. Remember what it says in James 1.22, do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. So whoever wrote this story ends it with this, this teaching moment for us. And that right there is the truth and the whole truth about the church that Jesus built. And any other layers we decide to add on to that can get us away from the church that Jesus built. See, we have to remember that the cornerstone of our faith, our very existence, is, is tied to salvation found only in Jesus Christ. And that is our primary mission. That is our sole focus. The church that Jesus built cares more about that than anything else. And I know that that requires a lot of us to have to reframe our thinking and reframe our hearts, but that is what our mission is all about. Amen. Let us pray. And before I start praying, I'm just going to leave a moment of silence if you want to wrestle with God on anything that you heard today, if anything's rattling around in your brain and your heart and you just want to give it to Him, take a moment to do just that. Ask God about the mission that He sent us on and what it means for us as individuals and as a church. Lord, we thank You so much for Your treacherous, uncomfortable calling in our lives. Lord, You came and gave everything of Yourself. You gave Your life for this life-saving mission. And You instituted Your church, of which we are proud to be a part, to be life-saving stations throughout the world. And somehow, in our culture, over time, we have lost our way, and we have forgotten Your primary purposes for our life together, for our gathering. We pray, O oh God, that You would speak into each of our lives and speak to us as a body so we might do the things that You have called us to do, that we might value what You value, and that we might pursue what You have called us to pursue. Lord, we thank You so much for the folks who are over in the fellowship hall right now in the kitchen getting a meal ready. As the temperatures drop, we realize that many are out on the streets without the comforts and the, the shelter and the food that we take for granted so easily, and yet we've got a team of folks who are diligently striving to serve these folks, to serve this community in that way. And we pray more than anything else that this meal and our hospitality would just be a sign of your love for them, of our love for them. God, that you would use this meal in our building as a means by which you can permeate hearts with your love. Lord, we have a number of people here in our church family who need an extra measure of your grace and comfort and healing during this time. We lift up the family and friends of Janet Kroll, who lived so well and was just such an amazing woman who has now gone home to you. As we prepare for a service tomorrow, we just pray that you would speak into the lives of many who are touched by Janet's life, by her love, by her ministry, by her humility. God, we pray that you would wrap your arms of love around her family and friends. Lord, we continue to lift up Louis Noval as he had a stroke last week and is recovering. We pray that you would be with Michelle and all those who surround their family with your love. We lift up the family of Bill King as they continue to mourn. We lift up Chuck, who's been hospitalized and 
has had a rough diagnosis. We lift up Bob Marsh, who spent some time in the hospital this week. We lift up Noelle, who needs an extra measure of your touch in her life during her formidable years. We lift up Copeland Carter at such a young age, getting his ear tubes put in on Friday. And we pray that you be with Chase and Allie as they go through that process and bring healing to his little body. For all these things said and many others that go unsaid, we know you're a big God who hears the cries of our hearts as well as the cries of our mouths, and you respond according to your will, and for that we give you thanks. Just as we give you thanks for this church that is just one but one small part of the larger church that you have built throughout the world over time and place, we thank you for your word that does teach us how to live, and we thank you for your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior, who taught us when we pray together to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Couple things to tell you about. Uh, I've had several people ask me about the service for Janet tomorrow. It is actually over at Westminster Towers. Uh, It's in the chapel. It's not a very big space, so they were expecting to have a a fairly um, small service with her family involved and the friends of theirs that lived over there. So um, you could be lifting up the family. Uh, in prayer. I know that it's uh, something they were expecting at some point. Janet was 98 years old, God bless her, uh, but also leaves a huge hole in the lives of that family and our church life as well. So uh, be lifting them up. Uh, We got Connection Sunday, which you saw on your way in, and it probably is still set up. So if you missed the opportunity to see what kind of smaller groups we have Uh, As we talk about cultivating hearts for Jesus here at First Press, we want you involved in those groups and those Bible studies because there's only so much we can kind of process and synthesize about our faith in a worship experience with music and a liturgy and a sermon. Uh, Those small groups are an opportunity to take and break down uh, what you're thinking about and what kind of prayer needs you have and what kind of fellowship you're looking for. So we've got a lot of groups available. Uh, Some of them are based on common affinities like the quilt group, the genealogy group. Some are straight Bible studies that happen during the week. We've got a Sunday school class that meets upstairs in between the two services every Sunday. We've got table talk groups that are more fellowship oriented, you get to know people. So a lot of opportunities for you to connect, no excuses to not connect. Um, And so I want to thank our team that got that all together today. If you brought anything to give to the Lord or if you have a contact card because you're new around here and you filled that out, if you have a prayer request and you filled that out, you could put those in the plate as they go by. And if you happen to forget to put them in the plate or don't have a chance to do so, go ahead and uh, put them in the little black boxes that you see throughout the hallway and in the Welcome Center. Gets to the office, gets curated from there. So... With that in mind, uh, this is a time for us to reflect on all the Lord has done for us. We reflect on our lives, and we, we come here to give back graciously. With that, let us now take our offering.
Friends, we go out these doors into the world, which is our mission field. And we must remember we are members of a life-saving station. And that's our job is to go out and be disciples in the world and lead others to Christ by the way we live and the things we say. So let us go. I know it's a lofty challenge, but that is the call upon every single one of us. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, amen.